famed proper banging vegan food, the legend that is Matt Pritchard. Give him a warm welcome, please. Hey, hey, vegan cap out, what's happening? Are you all feeling? Well, absolutely banging weather we've got. Uh, let me just get my, uh, my little clicker. It's quite unusual being on stage, actually, considering what I used to do many years ago. If anyone's familiar in the crowd, when I used to do my dirt, who remembers Dirty Sanchez? Yeah, nobody used to come up here, smash bottles on my head, stick drums, sticks up my ass. And now I'm talking to all you guys about veganism. Absolutely brilliant. Anyway, I'm going to start my um, presentation off with... In 2015, my life changed. I went vegan! <laughs> Something I thought I never would do, uh, but I'm so glad that I did it. Social media comments. Obviously, once you go media, uh, once you go uh, vegan, you tell everyone on social, I've decided to go vegan, and I'm sure you all in this crowd know exactly the kind of comments you get on social media, what you want to do that for. Uh, weirdos are vegan, where are you going to get your protein from? The absolute obvious. And um, where are you going to get your nutrients? And the last thing you want to be is vegan, considering all the endurance challenges you do. You'll be weak and become ill. So for me, I made it my mission to prove to everybody that just because I'm vegan, it doesn't mean that I'm weak and hopeless. So, I had a plan in mind. So I started a number of challenges and my first one since turning vegan in 2015 was to try and make a world record, which was a world record at the time. And that was 30 half Ironman distance triathlons in 30 days. That consists of 1.5 mile swim, a 57 mile bike ride, and a half marathon every single day for 30 days. And luckily for me, thank you. And lucky for me, Anna Loka, my uh, local vegan restaurant, they sponsored me. Anna Loka, any look Anna? Yeah, what a restaurant, man. But Adam, who owned it at the time, he said, look, I'll sponsor you, so every, every day you finish your um, challenge, I went into the restaurant and I had some absolutely scrumptious vegan food and it was absolutely banging. So they looked after me for the whole 30 days. I did it, I finished it. And at the time, I got the world record. So, and that was one step to prove it to people that just because I'm a vegan, it doesn't mean that I'm weak. Yeah. And then, three months after doing that, I'd signed up for the Triple Ironman. Now, the Triple Ironman is, is a, it, it, it's constant. It's not a one Ironman every day for three days. It was continuous. So it, it was, a 7.5 mile swim, a 336 mile bike ride, and a 75 mile run. Now that took me 49 hours, and I had 20 minutes sleep. Well actually I started falling asleep on the bike and almost ended up in the bush. So I had to have a little bit of a break. Um, and in 2018, I was the first person to seven Circumnavigational Triathlon of Wales. So I started in Penarth, jumped in the sea and swam 25 miles to Porthcawl, jumped on my bike and followed the coast all the way, taking in Anglesey as well, and then all the way to Prostatin where the start of Offers Dyke is. And that bike ride was about 800 miles. And then we ran all the way down uh, Office Dyke, which is very hilly, very lumpy, it's very tough. Uh, and we got to Cardiff, and I, and I wanted to finish with the Cardiff Half Marathon just to call it a day. So, <laughs> if that wasn't enough, finish with the Cardiff Half. But I love the Cardiff Half. And I managed to do it, finished, ticked another box. Again, another effort to prove to people that just being on a vegan diet, I am not weak.
And then I thought, that's not good enough. I'm always looking for the bigger and better things. Things to push me. Because I'm always looking for a good challenge. I mean, I can't just... The bigger it is, the more challenging it is. And so I decided to do the continuous dagger, which is 10 full Ironman distance triathlons in 10 days which it actually started today up in York, but this was back in 2009. Now the continuous is a 24 mile swim in a 25 meter pool. So that's 1,500 laps. Like literally you've got to block the pain out and just keep going. And as soon as you get out that pool, you jump on the bike. And the bike is a 1,120 mile bike ride in seven, and in a seven mile loop. So you're going around in circles for seven miles until you clock up that 1,120 mile before you go to the run. Now that bike ride took me five days and that was 21 hours a day on the bike with three hours sleep and then back on the saddle again. But going back on the saddle, my, excuse my language, the young ones of you, my undercarriage, I had no skin left, it was red raw, but I had to look after that because if it got infected, it was game over. So luckily I had a crew and <coughs> every single one of them refused to put cream on my gooch. So I had to do that myself. But uh, as soon as I got off the bike, um, I started the 262 mile run, which is around the one mile lake. So I just ran in circles for 262 miles. And to fuel me, I was, I used a lot of things really. Mainly, I don't know if anyone's here to Huel. I was using Huel because I get, it's vegan and it's got all the nutrients you need and it's really easy to eat. Because when you're doing long distance stuff, it, sometimes you just don't want to eat, but Huel helped me out big time. Anyway, I did that. And of course, I'm never happy. I want to find the next big challenge. And I got a call of somebody and said, would you like to row the Atlantic Ocean? If this next thing works. Hang on, I'll tell you about this. There we are. Rowing the Atlantic. Uh, Billy, this guy by here, he's the skipper, the one in the middle. He phoned me up and said, if you'd like to do it, we're going to go in January 2021. I didn't even think about it. It was lockdown, like all of us, our heads were in the clouds. Uh, and the last thing, I just, I just hated being locked down. I'd rather be locked down on the boat than locked down in my house. So I was like, yes, I'm absolutely game for it. I just checked my business partner, my fiance first, and they said, yes, you need to go for it. So I decided to um, sign up and do it. So I did it with a 62 year old guy called Martin. He's, uh, he's retired. And then Johnny at the end, he's a blogger and he's traveled to every single country in the world. Billy has done three oceans in the past. So he was the skipper and he had the experience. So um, we went to Lanzarote to start and the journey was going from Lanzarote to um, Antigua. We had three vegetarians on board, Martin, Johnny and Billy, and one vegan, obviously that was myself. Uh, I need to explain this photo at the end. Because <laughs> when Billy said, if you're going to ruin the ocean, you need to put on some weight. You need to put on at least two stone. Now I'm only 14 stone, so I needed to try to get the 16 stone. So I went and ate all the vegan junk food you could think of and absolutely put some weight on. And I managed to get about one and a half stone. And how flattering does that look? <laughs> what a fit specimen of a man. Anyway, so it was 3,002 miles of rowing across the sea. God, this ticker is not very good, is it? Oh, there we go. Right. Why? Why did we do the row? Well, for many reasons, really. We were doing it for a charity called Human, a mental health charity, uh, which absolutely amazing. And 
the Dean Fran Trust, of which I'm a patron of. The Dean Fran Trust, absolutely amazing sanctuary. They look after all the animals and all the volunteers are there and they do it for, for nothing. Really, really brilliant charity. So that's why we did it. Also, it, for me, it was a personal journey to test my physical and mental strength. Although I've done some crazy stuff in the past, will I be able to survive being on the boat in the middle of nowhere where helicopters can't even get you? You're in the middle of the sea, anything can happen. The boat could sink, we could be in trouble. So for me, it was a big personal journey. Uh, also, to inspire others. A lot of people think that these kind of challenges are not possible. Now, if they, hopefully if they see somebody like me with the background that I had, that can actually do this kind of stuff, then hopefully I've inspired many others to think, well, I can actually do the same thing. So that was a big thing for me. Uh, and obviously, again, to prove to a lot of people, when I said I was gonna go across the Atlantic, they go, what are you going to eat? You're a vegan. You're going to you're going to shrink away. It's like no, I'm fine. I got it all under hand. I managed to get a hold of some freeze dried um, and re uh, dehydrated food. We had Firepod and we had Extreme Food Company. Now these year, this is to to go for uh, we. 60 days of sea we were looking at so you need to get a lot of food so we got that's all the food they gathered up and that's the cabins that we kept the food in and to actually eat the fire pod food we had the uh, jet boiler so the jet boil is full of sea water and there was a machine that desalinated the water you dripped it into the jet boil turned the jet boil on uh, to get it hot, put it into the packet, roll it up, it rehydrates it, 15 minutes later, you can tuck in and start eating. What was the food like? Some of it was, eh, some of it was absolutely delicious, but it was one meal, it was absolutely hanging. And when we got to Antigua, there was just shitloads of that food left. But, but anyway, trying to eat, as you can see, I'm eating my food there. Now that cabin is, is not very big at all. And we were working in teams of two people. So I was with the skipper and Johnny and Martin were on their own. So we, what we did, we did two hours on, two hours off, 24 seven, until we got to Antigua. So once you're, once you're on the oars, you got five minutes left, you knock on the door, you wake the guys up, they get ready, they put, if it's raining, they get all the wet gear on. If it's not raining, they just shove the shorts on and they're ready to go. We swap over and we take our turns to make the food and, and eat it. And it takes, in that two hours, after eating food and sorting your wounds and everything out, which the wounds were plenty, then you can get your head down for about an hour and then you're back on the oars again. And that was just repeated 24-7. Uh, that was my favorite food there, the chili con carne. It was absolutely banging, I couldn't stop eating it. But uh, we, calories, we were chewing about 9,000 to 10,000 calories a day. And that's, you know, that's a lot of calories. And, to try and get that amount of calories into you when, when it's so hot outside and you're not in the mood for eating, it's such hard work. But um, we managed to do it. And that 15 and a half stone that I was, and within two weeks that just went. <laughs> it just looked like a skinny skeleton. I don't like this button. Hello, there we are. What happens, look, as you can see there at the end, that's four of us in one of the cabins. Now in that cabin, you've got all the comms, uh, you've got all the, the satellites and everything. We've got the satellite phone, we, we, we can phone, because we had Wi-Fi on board as well, although we didn't really use it unless we needed to, just to keep the social media up and stuff. But the good thing about being on the boat was 
It was really, really tough work. Like, it was the hardest thing I've ever done. But it was also one of the best things I've ever done. It, the peace was unbelievable. I couldn't even begin to tell you. Not having emails, not having phone calls, not having the stress of normal life. You're on a boat, you're surrounded by wildlife and just absolute beauty every single day of the week. The sun is shining. Yes, it's absolutely boiling hot, but it was absolutely amazing. And as you can see with these um, big blisters and welts on a hand, that was literally after one day of rowing. So you can wear gloves, but you just prolong in the pain. So I just went gloveless and I just put up with those uh, blisters until they popped. And then we got going and my hands stiffened up and they got, it, got used to it. Uh, sleep, like I said earlier, we literally got about an hour sleep. Some of the boys couldn't even sleep and some of them were sleeping whilst they were growing. So, yeah, I mean, <laughs> they were sleeping and uh, they weren't even rowing. They were just kipping and hanging on to life. And let me tell you, in the, the daytime rowing was really hard because it was so hot. There's nothing to, you know, shade you from the sun. So as soon as you finish on the oars, you went into the cabin and then the cabin was like an oven. So you couldn't escape from the heat at all. And the closer you got to the Caribbean, the hotter it got. Doctors, what happens if you get into a bit of trouble? Uh, we had a 24 hour doctor on call. Some of the boys needed antibiotics, um, in infection, crawls in really easy. Uh, some of the boys had an infection. Johnny had a rash. Again, sorry man, I said that. <laughs> he had a horrible rash by her and it wasn't going. And even the antibiotics weren't working. But we've got a massive bag of pharmaceuticals which can, which sort of sorts every kind of thing when you're in the middle of the sea. Big weather. When I was out on the sea, I really wanted to experience that feeling of being in the middle of nowhere and being at the elements really and just having big waves to shit me up. I know some people that's their idea of hell but one day we managed to get the big uh, the big terrible weather. Oh, it was unbelievable. We were on this little boat middle of nowhere, middle of the Atlantic and these waves were coming up you couldn't, and they were literally about two, two houses high and the next thing you're at the top of them and then you're down and you can feel yourself bottoming out. It was so gnarly and then in the night when you're in the cabin the door's closed because if you don't close the door a wave, a freak wave comes, comes over, goes into your cabin, you're screwed. You're literally screwed. Your boat's going to sink, all the electrics in there so you've got to be really careful. But in the night time when it really kicked off we just heard waves slapping the side of the boat and I was like, oh my God, man, I've got to go back out there. And we went back out and I started rowing and a wave, a freak wave came along, poof, knocked me right off my seat. And if you fall in the sea, you're dead. We haven't got a motor on the boat, you can't turn around. So unfortunately you have to wave goodbye to your, oh, your friends really. But luckily that didn't happen but I'm just giving you the reality of what could happen. Uh, did we see any wildlife? I saw plenty of wildlife. I saw loads of dolphins, a load of fish. Uh, and in the night, uh, the flying fish get attracted to the light on the boat. So we'd have these flying fish going across the boat. Some of them hitting us in the top of the head. <laughs> we wake up in the morning, obviously, I'd try it. If a flying fish come on the boat, I'd pick it up and chuck it back in the sea. But you can't do it forever. And sometimes in the morning you see flying fish lying all over the boat. But um, we saw plenty of wildlife. And when we were in the middle of the sea, we didn't see any of the boats because it was lock locked down, COVID. And we didn't see anything for three weeks. We were the only people in the middle of nowhere. Plus, being able to jump off the boat where nobody's most probably swam before, where the sea is 5,000 meters below was just an insane experience. So, so good. Uh, where do you do your number ones and your number twos? It's one of the biggest questions we've always been asked. We have, um, we have like a, a drinks bottle, we have a pee in, we go in the cabin, flop, 
there was no women on board, so they flopped out, you know what, inside, and then tip it over the edge. But for number twos, we use a bucket. And the first time I used the bucket, nobody told me you need to fill it with seawater first before you have a plop in it. So I just had a plop in it dry, and the skipper was like, what are you doing? I was just literally, shh, oh, sorry. Shh. There was shit stuck to the, stuck to the bucket. And he goes, you have to clean that fucking shit out, man. So I was there trying to clean out the plop off. And But once you do have a plop, you've got to be careful on which side of the boat you chuck the shit out. Because if the waves are coming one way, you chuck it out, and the shit comes back on board. And guess which dickhead fucked it up? <laughs> The skipper went, you. <laughs> so I had to try and, oh, it was horrible. Anyway, I cleaned it up. We got it done. I'm having a good relationship with this. There we are. Arriving in Antigua, how did that feel? It was one of the best feelings ever. Once you've been at sea for 52 days, and just, well, it's just constantly, non-stop rowing. Uh, I was the first person to see land. I sat there in, in my cabin, I was eating my dinner, and I just looked at the distance and I went, it's land. And the boy's like, yeah, whatever, boy, the boy that cried wolf, nobody believed me. I said, no, 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 see, this is land. We all turned around, I was like, yeah, we all had a massive celebration. But even though you saw land, you're still four days away from that land. So you've still got a lot of work to do. So it's the last thing I really wanted to see was the land because I got too excited thinking it was almost game over, but there was still a lot of work to do. Um, like I said, it, it took 52 days to get across. How did I feel? I felt brilliant, honestly. It was one of the best things I've ever, ever done. And uh, will I do it again? I've been invited to row across the Indian Ocean, which is 100 plus days of rowing, and we're, we're the first piece, we're the first people to ever do it. I haven't said yes yet. I have told my fiance. She did look at me off, uh, but let's wait and see. 2022, hopefully, I'll be going for another row across the Indian Ocean. Thank you. Uh, what did you do that day and night? Well, there's a <laughs> what did I do? As soon as I got off the boat, because they didn't stand up for 52 days, I forgot. So I stood on off the de decky and almost went head first straight back in the boat because my legs stopped working. I had to learn how to walk again and we got greeted with a big Jerome of champagne. I slugged four glasses of champagne, so that didn't help my legs either. And uh, I mean, it's not every day you do that kind of stuff. Uh, and I partied my pants off. 24 hours later, I was at the hotel reception. Billy and the boys went, are you, are you, um, are you in bed yet? I said, no, I haven't. Bloody hell. You must be the only person who's rode an ocean and still partied for 24 hours. I said, well, it's not every single day you cross the Atlantic Ocean on a boat, but we had a really good time. Antigua is a really lovely place as well. Uh, and more importantly, how much did we raise for our chosen charities? Well, in all, we raised £20,000, £10,000 going to the Dean Fan Trust, £10,000 going to uh, Human Mental Health, which um, I've been to Dean Fan Trust in Chepstow. If anyone hasn't, please, if everyone hasn't gone, please pop down and see them. They do amazing work. Or if you can, go on to um, uh, Just Give and you can give them a donation to um, help them with, uh, with the fantastic work that they do. Oh, here we go again. This little one. Come on, you little shit. Ding dong. Hi. And there we are. That's us off the boat after throwing 52 days, 52 nights. And let me tell you, rowing in the night time when the skies are clear is most probably one of the best things I've ever seen. You just look up, there's no light pollution. 
You can see the Milky Way, the stars are shining, and literally it's nature's cinema. And it was most, one of the most beautifulest things I ever saw. So even when the going gets tough, just throw, look up, see the sky, and all the pain is gone. It's absolutely brilliant. What does 52 days at sea do to your body? Do you want to find out? From 15 and a half stone to Axel Rose. <laughs> so I managed to finish and I was just under 13 stone. So salt the Jenny Cray diet, saw the dollies at the diet, get on a boat and row across the Atlantic and lose a load of weight. So yeah, it was, um, I mean, as you can tell, the pen looked like Robinson Crusoe going wrong. Will I do it again? Like I said, fingers crossed, I'll be doing the Indian Ocean. What's next? Uh, I've got a few things in the pipeline. I can't say anything in a moment, especially TV wise, but we've got some really good, um, got some really good ideas. A lot of people are interested. The Welsh Government are involved as well. It's all going to be doing with food. It's going to be per, uh, promoting veganism and trying to promote veganism to the younger generation and to try. And to try to make everyone realise that milk and dairy fucking sucks. <laughs> now, just before I play, I got I got a little video because we um, uh, for this row, there's a documentary, there's a film coming out about the documentary. So before I put the um, the, pro the promo video on, if you could be kind enough to turn your mobile phones off and not film it because I've been told by the bosses that because it hasn't been sold yet, um, they don't want anyone to have any of the footage. So if you could be kind enough to turn it off, I'd be much appreciated. Uh, meet and greet, I'll be going to the Viva tent after this. Uh, I've got some books to sign, if anyone's got their books to sign, I've got books to sale, meet and greet photos, wh whatever you want. But um, where's Lenny? Lenny, come and say hello. Hello. Come and say hello. Who's that then? Come on. Who's that? He just wants his ball. Let me sit. Sit. Let me sit. 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 <laughs> Anyway, that's them. Right, I'm going to put this. Um, I'm going to put this clip on. Basically, it's it's my my journey, my mental health journey, along with uh, the three other boys that we did it with. It's going to be out soon. And uh, like I said, if you could take your phone.